<laughs> All right. Okay, we are live. I am here with Mr. and Mrs. Timothy J. Gordon. I'm so happy to have you both here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, will you guys just introduce yourselves quickly for my audience in case they aren't familiar with you? Sure, yeah, I am Timothy J. Gordon and this is my wife, Stephanie C. Gordon. We are the authors of a couple important books on patriarchy along with, with yours, Rachel. Uh, my, hers yes. is Ask Your Husband, mine is The Case for Patriarchy. Oh, yeah, should I hold mine up too? <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> so we're, we're happy to be here. Fest. This is yeah. Patriarchy Fest 2023. Everybody, welcome. Um, if you're feminists, you, welcome. You can learn some things. Uh, hope you stick around and hear what we have to say. <laughs> uh, but I, I found Tim through Jay and started following his Twitter, and I was like, I like this guy. This might be my new favorite Catholic guy on Twitter, right? Um, and then I found out he has an incredibly based and awesome wife who also <laughs> wrote, you know, a book about patriarchy and about, you know, being a wife and, and things like that. And guess what else? They both have a whole mess of kids that they homeschool just like me and my husband do. <laughs> so we have a whole bunch of things in common. So I was like, I have to, I have to get them on my show because I think that anybody who likes my stuff is gonna love their stuff. And I wanted to ask them all of my deep uh, questions that I need to know. I wanna start by asking Stephanie the question that everyone always asks me, which is, why do you hate yourself and all other women? <laughs> Why do you hate yourself and why, right? Um, why do you hate women, Stephanie? What's going you know, on? <laughs> I hate, let me just tell you something I hate about what women have become. I hate how women have become selfish, all about themselves, how they've been, become bad wives, bad mothers, everything put it through the lens of how best to um, get attention, how best to serve themselves, and not how best to serve their husbands, and their children. So I actually have an answer on why I hate women. <laughs> modern women. <laughs> it's so funny because like people just, I get that thrown at me all the time. Like you hate women. Why do you hate yourself? And I'm just like, if you listen to me for more than five minutes, I don't sound like a person who hates myself. I don't no. think. Um, but let me tell you, I love what I I love women, particularly my favorite saint is the woman of women, and it's the Virgin Mary, the perfect, most beautiful woman that has ever lived, and she is yeah. the arc of femininity, and she no one's better than her. And I love, I came in. I'm a convert to the Catholic faith, and I came into the faith. Um, by her beautiful example and the way she served her son and the way she served her husband and, and our church. I just, her example, that's what I love about women. Steph's me, answer me, is, me, I, me, I don't me, hate me, myself. Mama. I just hate, I hate you guys who ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Tim just hates women, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny because I think you guys have like almost the opposite of what we have. We have four girls and a boy and don't you guys have a bunch of boys and like two, how many do you, what do you have? No, going? it's funny. We actually are the feminist worst nightmare because we have six daughters. And so we oh. are raising, just for the feminists out there, we are raising all six of our daughters exactly like this. <laughs> well, me too. And people, you know, everybody, I have a whole um, folder on my phone of like angry comments. Cause one of these days I'm going to do a stream where I just read all the mean comments for fun. So we can all laugh. Um, I love <laughs> just that. so people can see what I get in my inbox sometimes, but it's always like, I feel sorry for your daughters and your husband must be abusive. And like all these crazy, <laughs> you know, crazy things that people will say. And they find out I have a bunch of girls and they'll be like, Oh, this is terrible. I hope they ghost you as soon as they turn 18. I hope that they hate you. And I hope that they grow up and never speak to you. And I'm just like, this is, you guys are, I'm supposed to be the mean one. You right. know what I mean? Like I'm That's supposed funny. to be the meanie here, but uh, everybody's wishing all kinds of hate on me uh, just because I have daughters. Um, but I wanted to know, um, so you said you're a convert into the faith. Um, how did you guys meet? Tell us your, tell us your story about how you met and got together. Do you want to take that one? You're much better at the at the storytelling. Well, I, I was uh, <laughs> she was dating my best friend initially. We were playing playing mm -hmm. out uh, <laughs> clubs in a rock scene. I, I'm a revert to Roman Catholicism, like anyone that takes the faith seriously. 
after yeah. Vatican II, you pretty much, you're either not a serious Catholic or you're a revert. And so I was, you know, in college uh, playing regional and semi, you know, national shows and, you know, doing, doing that rock thing. And um, Steph had been asked to come out to a show by my buddy and they, they, they dated, you know, casually for a bit. And Steph and I just became best friends, which is funny because we give this relationship counseling. We're like, it worked for us, but don't be friends first. Just cut, cut right to the chase, you know, ask yeah. her a date. But we became literal best friends in this, you know, sort of defunct, not so serious relationship. Steph and I would just be up talking to late. I was dating a lot of different people at the time in Dallas. And she, she met a bunch of the girls I was going out with and it was becoming pretty obvious after a few months that we liked each other. And uh, so I just, I told them as they're kind of going through a break breakup, I was like, I want to let you guys know um, I have feelings for Steph. I'm in love with Steph and I've dated pretty much what feels like every other girl in Dallas. And <laughs> this is the girl for me and my friends <laughs> like, you know, uh, it was, it was a funny time, but we just immediately started dating and, and uh, knew we were, knew we were going to get married uh, throughout, almost from the very beginning of dating. It, it's, it's an amazing thing when you, as you know, Rachel, yeah. you find your best friend, you, you know, oh, yeah. doesn't mean you're equals. Aristotle no, lays no. out a very rigorous system in book seven and eight of the Nicomachean ethics. I was telling Pearl this yesterday with you there, uh, you yeah. can be best friends and not on equal footing in rank and yes, family. exactly. Well, that's kind of how it was for me and Andrew when we met. Like it was, I was terrified because I knew almost right away, and I was just like, "Oh boy, buckle up! This is like, I I just knew that it was going to be that way, and it was very overwhelming, and it was kind of like that for him too. And I think like he didn't really fight it; he was all about it, and I really fought it at first just because I was very scared." that's a whole other story. But yeah, it was like that. Like we knew right away too. And we are best friends as well. Like he always tells people, he's like, I know that like, I don't, I'm not generally a guy that likes hanging out with women for the most part, but my wife's yeah. kind of my favorite person. Like if I'm going to hang out with somebody, like I yeah. really want to hang out with her. So we, I feel very lucky and very blessed. And that's cool that you guys have that. So like then when, how old were you guys when you got married? Oh boy, I'm terrible with the dates and the times. But so we're, I'm, we I met you when you were 18. Hi, right? I met, I, I, yeah, I met him when I was 18 years old. That's right. I was coming out of high school. Is that that's so crazy to think about? See, I when we're counseling younger couples, it always makes it kind of brings a tear to my eye because I still look at this guy like we're 18 year olds, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we're in our 40s right now. It's going by so fast. It but, goes by fast. Yeah. So we've been married, gosh, almost 20 years. So. You were 23, wow. and I was 24 because you, you know yeah. it took a little bit of time to turn around the friendship to to really be able to start dating we we just kind of chilled with it i graduated college um yeah so we we got married right after you, you were almost 22 i was mm -hmm. almost still 23 but we both just turned ages so we're, we're we're close to you rachel we've been married 18 years in august you've been married you said 16 yeah we're, we're close in age you're, you're about six or seven months older than me only okay so, okay yeah, yeah. And it, we're bad with dates too. I'm not even joking. This is how bad we are with this stuff. There was one night that we were, because our anniversary is three days before Christmas. We got married December 22nd. So oh. there's always Christmas stuff going on and we're busy. And there was one night that I was like super tired and I was like, oh, there's all this Christmas stuff. I still got to do it because I always cook way too much food. I make like an absurd amount of food for Christmas. And now my daughters are older and they all like to plan it. And we have like 17 pies. It's very absurd, but we do it up on Christmas and we love Christmas. And I was just sitting there and it was like midnight. And I looked at my phone and I went, honey, and he goes, what? And I go, it's our 10 year anniversary. And he's like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Like we just totally forgotten that, that we're just like, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. <laughs> um, so we're just not like, um, I don't know, like we, we hang out so much that we're not like a couple that has to have like really structured date nights or anything like that. It, usually our date nights are nerdy stuff, like watching a documentary together and having something really good to eat. Yeah. That's hanging out. Yeah. Exactly. Like that, so. Since well, the seventh cool. kid came along, we, we we made a slightly more structured date night, but we've always, for the first six kids, uh, we always had just a, a, a laid back date night. But w when, when little Penelope came along, 
a year ago, we were oh, like, that name. <laughs> that name was on my list. My was girl it? name list. Oh yeah. Was I it? love that name. Penelope. We ran out of girls' names really fast. We had all these boy names and we yeah. ended up only having one son. So <laughs> Same for us. It was, I always had a ton of, boy, but I did have some girls' names, but all my girls' names were really, really old fashioned. So people either loved them or totally hated them. And Andy always picked, like, I kind of have a list and he would pick, um, except for our youngest is, her name's Betty. And uh, he picked that one after his grandmother. And it's perfect because now you can imagine her being named anything else. But when we told people we were naming her that, everybody was either like, Ugh, or they were like, oh, my God, it's so cute. Um, but so you guys got married kind of youngish. You've got seven babies now. Like, what are the what's the age range that you guys so are? Our working daughter, with Abby, um, she is going to be 15 this weekend, which is just crazy awesome. to think about. And actually, Happy birthday, Abby. Happy oh, birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Maggie. And help me again with the dates and ages. I'm so, so bad about that. Lord, help me. If like somebody and we're like applying for insurance or something and they ask me like the dates and the years of my babies, I need to like write it down on a document and be like, here. I know. I did it. <laughs> I'll go to the doctor or something and they'll ask me the date of birth. And mine are all born in the same like two months. So I have to go <laughs> February something, I think. And they're just like looking at me funny. But yeah, mm -hmm. all mine are born in February and March. So oh, it's so easy. funny. Oh, wow. I know. I have a time of year. I have a that, magic time of year. That tells you something about yourself. And, and then maybe your husband, too. Um, I, know. I used to have a joke with him where I'd be like, hey, be careful. It's June, okay? We all know how things happen in June. So just be careful. Don't sit too close to me uh, unless you want more babies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then there's Maggie's 12. She's kind of our uh, honorary eldest child. A Abby's... Uh, in a wheelchair. She was born in Rome. I was beginning a PhD out there in, in Rome, Italy. Um, we're just young, young married couple bashing around the eternal city and uh, really unexpected troubles just in the seventh or eighth month of gestation. She was born with intracranial bleeds and post hemorrhagic oh. hydrocephalus. So she's four brain surgeries in mm. actually the most recent one three years ago, they had to basically remove the left hemisphere or, or disattach it oh. anyway. But she's doing great, and um, good. She, she's the saint of the household. Uh, Ma, you know, Maggie's second oldest, and we had twins, uh, Charlie and Pip, or Charlotte and Peregrine. They are about to turn nine. <laughs> then we have little Gabriel Ambrose. He's the one boy. He's five. He is and... just like Tim. He is like a <laughs> mini Tim. It's yeah, so is. funny. <laughs> Look out, everybody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then we have Miriam Josephine. She's, she's also... Uh, just a box of dynamite or, or something. And uh, she's, she's about to turn four. And then little Penelope Pius is one year old. Oh my goodness. Well, congratulations and good job because so few people are doing this anymore these days. I do have Catholic friends though that have 11. So that's amazing. Whoa. So far, so far they're winning the race. Um, they've done a good job, but we could have gotten married earlier and then we, we could have, we could have had them. Right. Andy and I always say that and we always say we should have had more. And then people are like, they're always like, I don't know if you guys get this, maybe in Catholic circles, it's not as bad, but we're both former Protestants and we come from very like nominal Protestant backgrounds where it's like, yeah, Jesus was like a good dude or something. And like, we go to church <laughs> on Easter that kind of um my family was maybe a little more serious about it and on my dad's side but um generally the circles we come from when we say we have five children people are like <gasps> do you yeah. guys get that reaction when you say you have seven or do people oh, make so jokes funny. Like, you what should... is the reaction yeah it's great tim has like a slew of things he tells people like when they stop and they his favorite is when they're counting like almost like really dramatically our children and when we're walking through a store they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. The <laughs> In South Mississippi here, it's a, a lot of Baptists. It's great, beautiful forest, forest country with, with you know, Trump flags flying everywhere. And so we love it coming from Southern California where, where oh, we're from, having been canceled. But they, they have, you know, Baptists have basically the same culture of death when it comes to mm -hmm. getting the what they call the snip snip or condoms neutered. or whatever yeah they're neutered we call it neutered 
uh, as as the the far left wokesters in Southern California. So that we do, we are familiar with that, Rachel. Yeah. 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 We. Uh, I would start getting the, it was like after two, it's like two is the acceptable number. Anything after that, people start saying stuff like, have you figured out what's causing that yet? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we like like, yeah. Yeah, we're like, <laughs> oh boy, you guys, oh, we know what you guys do when you have spare time. You know, like you get all these comments and people just are so comfortable with the antinatalist like rhetoric and jokes I find. So whenever I find other people with lots of kids, I'm always like, can you guys get this too? It's funny because Tim will just turn it around on them where they're trying to make these comments, but it's funny to watch him because he'll just, he's like, no, I'm going to make you uncomfortable. So <laughs> he'll say things to him like, well, which one do you think we shouldn't have? Like, which one of them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, which one of them shouldn't live? Which one shouldn't have existed? I know. It's, Give us some drag. Yeah, I'll tell him, hey, condom and contraception are for guys uh, whose wives have uh, boyfriends. <laughs> that's a good one yeah I'll have to tell andrew to start using that one but somebody in the chat sabrina said about stephanie she looks so young and fresh seven kids wow i will tell you something oh, thank you <laughs> i feel like us ladies who have lots of kids i really do feel like there's something about it i don't know if it's hormones i, don't, I couldn't tell you exactly what it is but i feel like we age slower yeah, I, I hope that that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Just in my sample size of women that I know, those of us who have like quite a few, like four plus probably, I really feel like we age more slowly. And my friends who've either never had kids or maybe had one and that was it, um, especially if they're feminist, it's like they, I don't know, I couldn't tell you if it's like a physical reason, like hormonal reasons, or if it's just like the misery and unhappiness or like being around young life keeps you young like there's an old saying like that i don't know what it is but i've just noticed just pure anecdotally that all of us ladies who tend to have bigger families i feel like we stay younger longer we look and feel younger longer than than women who don't that's just what i've noticed so you'll have to now that i've said it you'll have to like see if you notice it too oh yeah no for sure and i think too there might be something to the fact that i have thanks to this guy here, a very easy life. I'm protected. I'm at home. I get to do my hobbies throughout the day. I don't have to go out and work. You know, I get to spend time with my kids. Me and my, my elder daughters are learning to watercolor together. We sew, yeah. we just do, we garden, we do fun things. So it's like, I just, I'm not wearing the weight of the world. So maybe that's helping with the um, youthfulness. <laughs> Yeah, do well, I feel like it's that. I feel like it's that too. Like I don't know when when I married Andrew, and he was like, "No, you should stay home. Like I'll I'll figure it out. Like I'll work as much as I have to, but you should stay home with the kids." I breathed like this huge sigh of relief because I've always had like I had the parents, the boomer parents, that were like, "You have to go to college and you have to have a career." And when I had my first daughter, I didn't want to do that, and I felt like. I just, I was like depressed at the thought of having to like go to work and not raise the kids myself and drop them at a daycare and stuff. And I feel like it's this huge weight off of you that I think so many women would actually really enjoy if they can get past all the brainwashing, if they can get past all the propaganda, you know, then it's like this huge relief of like, oh, I don't have to compete with men. I don't have to try to be a man. I don't have to compete with my husband for like, who's earning the most. And like, we have to keep a chore chart because we have to make sure we're doing equal amounts of chores and that we're making equal amounts of money. Like this insane competition, even if people don't mean to, I feel like they fall into that. And I just think um, that, yeah, the stay at home mom life, it is busy. It's not like you're, we're, you know, just like uh, sleeping in until noon and, you know, um, doing drugs and laying on the couch or something. It's not like that. <laughs> it's there's plenty to do and there's a lot of responsibility and there's plenty of days where you know like if they all get the flu at the same time and you're sick too and you've got to, like, i remember one time just being like taking puke buckets like from one kid to the next and then like you know cleaning it all and just being like oh <laughs> yeah, kind of days like that right yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We there's those that. moments where you're like wow okay i've i've but then when you have your your good days that are so much less stressful you're like i earned it on those hard days when i was up all night with the baby that had the ear infection or everybody got sick at the same time 
So there's lots of responsibility, but it is, uh, you're not in the rat race. It's not this like fast paced, get out the door in the morning, you know, be separate from your whole family all day and then try to come home at night and like you're exhausted and you don't, you don't have any energy for your husband. You just don't really want to deal with your kids or whatever they have going on. Like that's just a, a miserable existence. And I think that a lot of women would really actually love the life that you and I have uh, because of the men that we have. So it, I, I try to encourage women all the time to like, j okay, just put aside the propaganda for a minute and just think about it. Um, right. But I'm sure we'll get to all that. Oh, Chase Haggard sent a super chat for 199. He said, Tim, what's your favorite guitar brand and why is it PRS? <laughs> oh, I, I was going to say Paul Reed Smith. Uh, we 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 played in that Paul, Paul Reed Smith through <laughs> Mesa Boogie Wattage. Uh, it was the best for the kind of you know aggressive rock music we played. He he was just like leading me there, and I was going to say Paul Reed Smith. <laughs> Chase My, is a phenomenal guitarist himself and a musician. So, oh, okay, cool. You you got yeah. your, your buddy. That's cool. You know something mm -hmm. about super chatters. Uh, P PRS is a beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful sleek small black body and it, it has an amazing sound particularly through mesa boogie wattage um I'm, I'm not a guitarist my older brother's a phenomenal guitarist and um i was a singer so but yeah that that's that's nice. a beautiful guitar also like i mean you can get a really good sound uh, out of aggressive rock music through you know um jackson jackson guitars are are underrated or were underrated in our day i think after stranger things four people ah. have a renewed appreciation for them but yeah. um, that's another thing we have in common then because andrew and i are like big rocker like metalhead types which people think is really weird they're like wait you're like these conservative christians and you're also like into all this like yeah. oh yeah <laughs> yeah I am, uh, my, my family is it's funny that the, the, the super chatter asked that question my my father and a bunch of my uncles are guitarists and they're they're fender men um but yeah. that i my dad actually i knew all, like every genre of music my dad is like a music i don't know like savant like an aficionado oh yeah and i'm talking punk rock or like metal every everything it's like from every and that's how i met tim is in like the music scene so i'm also into like people would be actually surprised something they don't know about me at all is i like very interesting heavy music <laughs> I do, too. I do too. I love all kinds of music. Like I played oboe and symphony growing yeah. up. I played drums and percussion. I did play guitar. Not like great. I was just like a very basic guitar player. Yeah. Um, I just kind of played a little bit of everything. Oboe, I was really, really good at um, and took that like as far as I could take it without going to college. But I do also love me some aggressive rock and roll music from time to time. I know, I know, all all my favorite bands have probably made a deal. Okay, like what yeah, can I, I tell you yeah. about it? I can listen to Ella Fitzgerald that. during the day, and I can listen to like whatever, like the Deftones in the evening. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly, you got it. We, these, this is why I have them on, you guys. These are my new favorite people. <laughs> also, we're, um, we're, we're for the record, Rachel. We're I'm something people don't know this about me. I don't get a lot of credit when I do Catholic videos. I, I can be rough on the Protestants, but um, we're, we're something of Catholic Orthodox ecumenists. I, uh, you know, I, I like I like your boy Jay there. And mm -hmm. I, I really I really well, I, I have a hard time uh, at some time seeing what's been positive at all in the last five hundred and seven years of, of Protestantism. Yes. Uh, I, you know, I, I really, I really, I'm strongly philosophically, ideologically in favor of Catholic Orthodox ecumenism and, and, and loving the, uh, the metal and the East coast hardcore just helps. So. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. Well, and me coming from a Protestant background, I am very hard on the Protestants as well. And people like I've gotten a couple of bad book reviews, grumpy book reviews about that. And uh, some comments from people who are like, I don't understand why you're so, why you go so hard at them. And it's not, it's because I love them. Mm -hmm. It's because I came from that background and I always knew something was missing and that things didn't add up and that it was just so empty and there was a lot of things wrong with it. I couldn't articulate it back then, but I can now. So sometimes I do and people will get a little bit salty. And I'm just saying, Protestants, I love you. And I just want you to know there's so much more. You're just missing the fullness of the faith. And I think one of the things that Orthodox and Roman Catholics can agree on is like, we both still have, you know, like 
sacraments and we have ritual and we have holy mysteries and we have we have things that are still like the real faith whereas protestantism has become like jay always does his bit about um uh pastor randy ball strip mall church have you guys seen that <laughs> yeah it was good i saw that two days yeah. ago yeah. I, I showed that to my husband and he laughed for like way too long because he that's the kind of churches that his mom would like occasionally try to drag him to and he could just never get into it he's like i believe in god but all this like woman church stuff he just i couldn't drag him to it and he didn't want to go so when we found orthodoxy and the first time we went to a divine liturgy my husband was st standing there you know and he just he looks over at me and he's just like <laughs> he was just like yeah. yes this yeah. is, I can, this I can do. Right. Um, and it's been great, like for our family. Um, but that's, if you guys are wondering, that's why I go hard at the Protestants. It's not because I don't love you. I do love you. I just want more for you than what you are currently having. So that's all. Um, you guys, can you tell us, so who, who wrote a patriarchy book first? Whose book came first? Tim's book. Yeah. Okay. And it's called the case for patriarchy. And this is cool. Cause my second book, which will be out this fall, is called the case against feminism and it's my 15 best arguments just laid out with all of the citations and the references and all that stuff so that if people don't want as much of the like religious historical bent to it it's just like my 15 best arguments that i use in debates um so that's cool we could have like maybe we could do like a holiday box set where you get the case for patriarchy the case against <laughs> feminism and then you get ask your husband and you get a cult feminism it's just like a a holiday box set. Dude, we oh, should right. literally do that. <laughs> yeah, we, we should, really we should. should. I love that idea. <laughs> I love that idea because one thing you, you said, we're, we're, we're your favorite PDF. Catholics. I, yeah. There aren't, I don't know who else you would even really be chilling with besides me and Steph because Catholicism for – it's so overrun with feminism. You and you and I just went on Pearl Pearly Things show yesterday about this. It's so badly yeah. overrun that even center right Ascension Press type Catholics are literally saying wifely submission is a bad thing. So there's mm -hmm. there's not really any other Catholics out there making the case for patriarchy. So we we should we should totally in the spirit of ecumenism do a four book box set. Uh, I think it would be really cool. I'll have you on my show when that gets mm -hmm. ready to come out. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, what I wanted to ask, so like I went to your guys's Amazon and Goodreads to see, cause I was looking at my reviews and I'm like, I bet they're going to get about the same kind of reaction. And it was like, the numbers are almost exactly the same, like overwhelmingly good reviews, almost the exact same percentage of bad reviews that say the exact same things. It's basically right. like really grumpy feminists who, straw man everything we say right say uh, this person hates women and they want to chain women to a stove in the kitchen and they don't want to have our us to have rights and like this you know they'll write a whole letter to the manager about <laughs> what they don't like and most of them you can tell did not read the book right you it's can, like most I of them read like your this. reviews and I was like I can tell these people didn't read the book because they're just arguing like a typical straw man feminist argument that doesn't really have anything to do with what the book even says it's about. Right. So I wondered what's your reaction been like from the Catholic world on your books? It's funny for me, like reading the, I love the, the feminist, um, like just crap posting reviews on my book because it's, it's always hilarious because it's, there'll be like, women are not hysterical or irrational. And what proceeds is a hysterical or irrational scream. scream. Yes. <laughs> It's just so funny. Yeah, the Catholics, it's interesting. Um, they really hated, um, for the most part, what I had to say. But I always tell them that I'm the best friend you never had. I'll tell you the truth. I'll tell you actually how to make your husband happy, even if it means losing weight, cook more, stop nagging, uh, be more attentive to your appearance, be more attentive to how you speak to your husband, how you ask him things, the things you ask him for, uh, all those things. I, I just go right after it and ask your husband. So I, when I got the negative responses, I know it was just because I, I, I touched a nerve. I yeah. Women, the, the great thing about the women who loved my book is that those women are the ones that legitimately love their husbands and yeah. want to yeah. please them. And I think that, that that's the mark of true femininity is that you want to serve, you want to please yeah. the man that you chose to spend your life with. Um, and in my book, 
I really go after it and just say, hey, listen, this is what men do not like. This is what they do like. This is not objective. This is not objective. I mean, we're doing a dating right. service right now where we're interviewing a hundred men. And I can tell you the first three things that they're asking for, it's always the exact same stuff. So yeah, ladies, it's totally, totally objective. Yeah. It's yeah. totally objective. Yeah. Though it, yeah. it sound it feels like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but it's it's not subjective. No. It um it's remarkable to ask men what are the main three things you want, women, what do you want? Different flavors, shapes, sizes, they all want the same thing. One one um really consistent remark by these a lot of them are center right, so-called anti-feminists from within Catholicism, which is so badly overrun. <laughs> they will always say that Steph's book, Proof Texts, I, I don't know if you got that one too, but they'll say, oh, you're, you, you know, you, you pulled all these quotes from the Bible that say women have to submit to their husband. That's proof texting. It's like, no, that's proving. <laughs> that's and not to prove them wrong, I was like, okay, ladies, I'll take you up on the challenge. I have never actually read the Bible. I will go through the Bible through Lent. I will read every single thing, and I'll show you my Bible. I don't know if it's up here, but I highlighted every single thing in that Bible that had anything to do with women at all. I made copious notes in the back where I'm saying this woman is in the Bible. She worked, she was, uh, but she was unmarried or working, meaning like made threads in her house. But I, I was like, okay, fine. If you think I'm proof texting challenge accepted. I will go through the Bible myself and I will see if that's the case. Not at all. As a matter of fact, th in this book, I wish I could come out with a second version because I found like, I think initially it was like 20 Bible verses. I end up finding like 70 more. more to add yeah. in. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Like, that's why I'm like, I'm going to be writing books till I'm dead. Cause I just keep finding more and more. And I always approach, I do a lot of history stuff, right? I do a lot of historical because the historical record on feminism is a total lie. It's yeah. a straight up manufactured lie. The way they tell people things happen is not how things happen. They, in the 1970s, the feminists took over with the gender studies departments and they used something they call standpoint theory, which is we're going to retell history from the supposed standpoint of the oppressed woman, mm -hmm. right? So the average person on the street, the history they know about women's rights is a lie. It's wrong. It's totally incorrect. <laughs> and so I spend a ton of time like citing historical examples and texts and the writings of feminists themselves and all this kind of stuff to try to debunk that and set the record straight because I think that's super important. Um, but yeah, they just, they don't like the, uh, I mean, the word submit, you can watch most women just like physically recoil when you say submit or submission. And um, I posted a tweet that said mutual submission is bullshit and it's a cope. It <laughs> and then Tim uh, retweeted that and he posted something similar and then his whole like thread of Bible verses. And he's like, just read them, right? <laughs> Which people don't want to do or they want to like nitpick or try to uh, say, well, it doesn't really mean that. What it means is something completely different than what, what it means. Um, but yeah, there's just like this uh, mental gymnastics people will do like anything besides tell a woman that she's not the boss. <clears throat> exactly. So tell women there are standards. Tell women that, <clears throat> they, um, that they're doing a crappy job being wives and mothers, that they're self-serving, that they need to do more, um, less looking for uh, attention and adulation out in the world and try to get the attention and adulation of one man. Yeah. That, you tell women that then it's like it's oh they, they freak out it's just a hysterical yeah. nightmare that you're dealing with and lucky for people like you and i i i that doesn't bother me at all like right they yeah freak and 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 freak out and post their selfies non-stop on on instagram oh look at me look at me with my lip fillers like they can do that all they want to but i'm just back there like yeah i know i touched a nerve like you know i'm right yeah. you know when you know we're right that's why you're bad but it's yeah. it's if we could <laughs> I mean, standpoint theory in action has been best intoned by Noam Chomsky, where he says, like, look, to, to kill a worldview, the true anti-feminist worldview, which is, it's my book, Case for Patriarchy, but let's take true anti-feminist women writers. There are mm -hmm. two I know of, and I'm, I'm talking to both of them right now, from within <laughs> Christendom. And in, I could tell your viewers in the Catholic world what happened is um noam chomsky is just saying chop off you know the top part the most conservative part of a spectrum on a given topic 
And all of a sudden, your new high is what was formerly the center. And you call that anti-feminism. That's alive and well. Yes. And it's in, oh my gosh, it's so <laughs> effective. Like this summer, we have a couple of Catholic anti-feminist books coming out and they're, they're on one of my publishers. So I, I don't want to run them down too much. I think there's a lot of truth in them, but they are not anti-feminists of the Steph Gordon, Rachel Wilson mold. They are, they are openly both anti-wifely submission. And yeah. one of them is Peachy Keenan, who uh, yeah. has this book, uh, Domestic Extremism. And it's like, she went on Spencer Clavin's like, no, not, not submission. That's bad. I'm an egalitarian. Uh, you know, I think she said something like my husband and I are not equals. And right there, that's you're wrong. You're not. They equal. are equals. Or, or they are equals. Yeah. She's like, no, you're not. Yeah. Equal. You are not equals with your husband. Like that, yeah. that is just not the case. Now, that doesn't mean you, you should be treated horribly. As right. a matter of fact, you're treated better when you realize uh, that's the thing that uh, I challenge women to is like, just start serving your husband lovingly and watch what happens. And I get emails I know. daily by women who are like, you know what, once I just started being a non crap wife, my husband started being really good to me back in return. And Isn't that, it amazing? Yeah, yes. That's realizing yes. that you are not equals with your husband. You're not. There's not two bosses in your household. You can right. be best friends, but our Aristotle calls them a friendship of unequals. I go into that in my book as well. It's like a king and a subject, our Lord and the church. There is a hierarchy, and hierarchy yes. is so beautiful if done properly. Yeah, and all of God's creation, there's even hierarchy among the angels. There's hierarchy in nature. Everything mm -hmm. is designed this way. It doesn't have to be bad, but because we've been brainwashed with this egalitarian nonsense, which is, it should be so easy to shatter. And I think that's why um, a lot of times, like I've had people that I even convert, like in the middle of a debate, we had a woman that was like the most vicious like she was like, mm -mm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tear this woman to shreds. And she was just like coming for me, you know, calling me names. And by the end of this debate, she was like, you know, actually, now that I think about it, like, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, if I had, there was probably a lot I could have done that could have kept my husband from like us from getting divorced. And, and I do miss having a protector at home and, and maybe if I had been different, like maybe that wouldn't have happened, like in front of the whole world. And this was like on modern day debate. And it kind of like tugged at everyone's heartstrings. We all kind of yeah. felt bad because you could kind of see her like coming to these realizations in front of your face. And it takes a lot of humility to admit that, which I say is the number one reason women won't. And yeah. feminism teaches women never to have humility and never to be repentant. And those two things are going to separate you from the kingdom of heaven. You cannot get into the kingdom of heaven if you refuse to repent and you refuse to have any sort of humility. And that's one of the reasons I feel like it's a very Luciferian doctrine. I mean, there's many reasons it's just like in your face Luciferian, but certainly to tell all women that you're perfect the way you are, you are above any sort of criticism. You are never the fault in the relationship. It's always the man. The world is out to get you and you are oppressed and you have to overcome and be a strong, independent boss bitch and use your sexuality to manipulate the will of others. There's nothing more Luciferian. I mean, that's no. like, it's just exactly. in your face, Luciferian. Yet we have all these Christian women who try to smash Christianity and feminism together and say, well, I'm a good Christian woman, but I'm also a feminist. And that's why um, my book was also kind of directed a lot at them as well, just like yours was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we probably all three of us knew that putting these kind of books out, of course, you're going to get some pushback. Of course, you're going to get some people who are going to be mad. We all know that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like it's bizarre to me when the secular types are more open and receptive to what we're saying yes. than, than yeah. the Christian wives are. What do you guys think about that? What's your experience been? Well, it's funny to me going through the Bible, how uh, brutal it is on women. I don't know where these Christian feminists are getting off. I mean, the Bible says like living in a house with a nagging wife, it's like living in a house with a leaking roof. They compare them to all sorts of things that are un favorable like like it's very clear in the bible that women should be in a specific sphere in a specific place so it's funny they want to they want to charge us of cherry picking and i'm like name one give me a verse in the bible that even 
Anyone. You, I am asking them to cherry pick. Please cherry pick something to throw yeah. against the 35 pages of, of evidence and documents that we have and combat what we're saying. But they, they yeah. just can't do that. Also, I just no. I, I would take a minute to this came through Sophia Press and both me and my publisher. They're, they're really good people. Mm -hmm. They're my kind of home home publisher. I've been on a you know, published in three different places, but we were surprised how tepid the mm -hmm. wave of fury against us was when I, when I came out with this in fall of 21. And it was Steph's book that was supposed to be the companion piece to it, Rachel. And it came out six months later in spring of 22. And any amount of uh, opprobrium or shame or backlash that I thought would come with this book, like more than redoubled. And Steph got for this because she and, and you too are like basically called sex traders. You're the, the female yeah. Clarence Thomases. Mm -hmm. It, uh, I can't even tell you, um, the full story. I'm not, I'm literally, it, it would be, uh, illegal for me to, because of the whole imbroglio that went down, but it was the nastiest. Mm -hmm. It was one of the nastiest things I've ever been a part of. Um, and it was, the heat was coming, like you just said, mm -hmm. from, the center right Catholic anti feminist crowd who thought yep. they held a corner in the market, but did the Noam Chomsky thing and said, like, we're, we're, we're anti feminist, but women can work. We're anti feminist, but the, the conjugal debt is not a thing. We're anti feminist, but wives shouldn't be submission. Husband. I'm equals. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, that no. It's a partnership. It's an yeah. equal partnership. You yeah. know what's really funny about that is that when marriage is done properly, it works a hundred times better than what they're claiming their marriages are are, are like. Yeah. And I'm sorry to be that blunt, but it's the truth. The best, yeah. most loving, the, the men that I know in my life that have the wives that truly love and serve them, treat them the best. It's the one, the wives that are like, oh, okay, I'm the boss of this household, whose husbands are gone over the weekend, yep. uh, golfing all, all, all the time, not wanting to really spend time with them. Tim and I spend... I, I don't even, I can't even tell you. I don't even know if there's all an hour. All, literally all of our time together. He works from home. And if he has a speaking gig or a book gig, I am right there with him. And you know why? Because he wants me there. Because I'm not nagging yeah. him. I'm not making his life miserable. I'm trying to make his life better. <laughs> That's why he wants to spend all this time. It's with not me. complicated. <laughs> she's she's pretty and nice. And I know yeah. your husband feels yeah. that way. That's like, what my that's what Men my like husband pretty nice girls. This is him, by the way. He's the Crucible Limited in the chat. That's what he always says. He's like, well, my wife is really nice to me, and I like her. So, you know. Wave, um, wave <laughs> he said, right. Wave of Fury sounds like an action movie in a world where a Catholic and Orthodox fight against feminism. <laughs> One man will hold back the tide. <laughs> That's funny. Um, um, but, it was yeah, nasty, I mean, though. It was nasty. It was can nasty. I just, can I say that? Or would this yeah. feel yeah. like... Um, like therapy, we need a couch in here. Steph was pregnant with little Penelope, mm -hmm. oh. and it was in the second going to third trimester. It was one of the nastiest things ever. Steph is unflappable, generally speaking, from a, a, a really, really, really tough childhood. She's one of the mentally toughest people I know. She's got these skinny little arms, but she's, <laughs> she's super mentally tough. But I'd never seen her because the way she got come after not by the lefties who she'd been mocking on Twitter, you know, when she still had a Twitter account, but by fellow Sorry, fellow know. Catholics. That was um, by fellow Catholics who are not considered even, you know, left cats who are a very con confused breed. It was uh, I had to order like, don't even read any more reviews. You're going to lose the baby. Your stomach was starting to hurt. It, these are the like when we see you online, Rachel, we're like, oh, man, that just seems like a really, really nice lady who gets it. It's funny. You guys, are, you and Steph are supposed to be the hateful ones. It's like you're like one of the only other ladies out there on Twitter, including all the center rightists and, and conservative uh, broads at Conservative Inc. They, they're just they're just all boss babes, boss yeah. bitches. And, you know, we're like, Rachel seems super nice. So like game recognizes game. I guess uh, anti-fem recognizes anti-fem. And also I think Rachel and I actually truly do. I mean, we can be accused of all sorts of things, but I know you 
enough to say, I know you and I feel the same way. We actually do love women and we do want yeah. them to, to have beautiful, great lives. And the truth hurts sometimes, ladies. And sometimes yeah. you got to be told, hey, listen, you got, you got, you sold a pack of lies and you wasted a lot of years on your life on that. And I'm telling you, I wish I could publish all the emails I get almost on the daily of women who are like, listen, I hated your gut stuff. I thought you were a total B. I, I threw your book down three times when I was reading it. But once I started actually doing the things that you were suggesting doing in your book and serving my husband more, more intently and faithfully, our marriage has never been the same. Because men respond very well to just a loving wife at home who's taking care of herself and taking care of him it's almost amazing how quick the, the like problems will start getting worked through once the woman starts taking control of herself go figure yeah. pretty pretty and nice that's all men want mm -hmm. and yeah and be virtuous yeah totally um it that was my experience because i was raised by like a very marxist feminist mom like a militant uh you know, she volunteered for Planned Parenthood, um, like the really far left, like the crazy stuff you get into in university kind of Marxist yeah. feminism stuff. Um, and I never I never really was like that myself. I had like a conservative dad. And so I was kind of in the middle, just like watching everything go on and as I was growing up. And I knew like I didn't agree with my mom, but I didn't you know, I hadn't thought about it a lot until I had my own kids and did a whole bunch of things wrong in my 20s, totally screwed up my life and had to put it back together and fix it um, and realized like, oh, yeah, it's me. Like, I need to reexamine my attitude and my thinking on things. And like, that's that's like a, something you have to do with anything in life. If you are screwing up or you're not doing so great in an area of your life, all you can do is look at yourself and adjust yourself. But we teach women not to do that. Specifically, we teach them if you're overweight, that's awesome. It's the world who has a problem with it. If you're a brat, if you're like a just a spoiled brat, you're just you know your worth. You just know your worth. And if, if everyone else doesn't see it, like whatever, they can just like they can just you know what? Um, it's just like this horrible culture that we have that's specifically at women. We don't tell this to men. We don't tell men they're wonderful the way they are and that nothing's expected of them right. and that they're valuable just intrinsically for existing. Men <laughs> never go through that. They don't have this experience. When was the last time you saw a guy in a, with a dad bod modeling underpants? <laughs> I, 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 I bald. Or yeah, like I have never seen that. That was just well, women all the time doing that. Yeah, it's one of it's one of the things that like you know a, a, I get a t I get more criticism really from like the right wing women as well. Um, mm -hmm. The it's usually like the TPUSA moderate right women yeah. who really really don't like me and what I'm saying and right. think think I'm mean and they'll kind of misrepresent what I'm saying and they'll accuse me of all kinds of things, but. I'm like, listen, I have daughters that are 20 and 22. I know what the age group is like. I've met all their friends. I've met their friends' moms. Like I, I live in the real world. I didn't start doing this when I was 16, okay? Like I've lived in the real world my whole life. Mm -hmm. And this is the way it is. So like the, the women you see on Pearl's channel or on Fresh and Fit or on the whatever podcast, that's really what we're dealing with. That's what we're actually working with. And I think people don't want to admit that. They, they're like, no, no, they find the worst women. They find the worst women on purpose. And I'm like, eh, I don't think so. Because this is who I'm dealing with every day. I'm dealing with the kind of women every day that it's like you, you just take the tiniest little poke at their programming and they lose it, right? So it's like, yeah, they really do freak out and... Um, I just think that if women were doing so great, there wouldn't be a need for us to say what we're saying. Oh, yeah. um, and, and then we get accused of grifting. I'm sure you've gotten that too. Like, oh, you just wrote this book for money. You're just a grifter. Oh my gosh, that I always tell people that say that about us. It's like, you're just mad because you're not talented enough to grift. <laughs> well, I'm like, 
Wouldn't the easier <laughs> grift be for me to do what everyone else does and just like start an OnlyFans or I know, right? Yeah. Or imagine this with because I'm good at research, I'm good at debate, I'm pretty good at like public speaking and stuff. Why would I not try to be a TPUSA uh, Women's Leadership Summit boss girl? Why wouldn't I be there in my power suit? You know, like <laughs> right with uh, all of these other right wing women doing the like middle of the road, not much pushback. You get this broad appeal, you get tons of money, you get endorsements. If I was a grifter, why wouldn't I pick something way easier than this? I literally picked the hardest thing to talk about. Right. I know. Women. It's so easy to be a woman's prophet and go out there and tell them, hooray for everything, girls, you are doing great. Don't ever change. Like that's yes, how exactly. grifters make money. It's hard to write a book that says, lose weight, stop knacking your husband. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's what I always say. I'm like, Stephanie and I are not selling you the sexy message that women want to hear, right? Women don't want to hear, uh, work on your attitude, uh, reevaluate your whole worldview and how you're treating everyone and what your expectations are versus what the value you're bringing into like your husband's life, you know, the stuff we're saying, and we're telling them, you know, sacrifice, think about your children first, think mm -hmm. about your husband first, be a servant. Uh, serve people. That's not a sexy message that's no, like no. just going to sell like hotcakes and make us stars overnight at all. We're selling like a, a more uh, ascetic, self sacrificial kind of path that mm -hmm. most women don't want to hear, but we know that they need to hear. It. And there is joy in it. There is. Like Steph was just saying, like her life is pretty good. My life is great too. Mm -hmm. It's It's very much worth it, but it does take an ability to look at yourself, uh, be able to evaluate yourself honestly, uh, fix your own issues, your own shortcomings, work on your attitude. You know, it, that's kind of hard. Like I'm a pretty outgoing and uh, strong headed kind of person and I can be a little bit obstinate and stuff too. So like when Andrew and I were younger, I really had to kind of train myself and he, he I don't know if you guys have this experience, but he kind of trained me. And then people will be like, you're brainwashed, you're brainwashed. I'm like, no, no, no. For example, when we first started dating, I had a lot of shitty woman behavior that I got like from my mom, who was this mm -hmm. like, I, she was like a super man hating, like literally hated men type of a person. And I thought I was really good compared to her, right? So I didn't think <laughs> I had anything wrong with me. I was perfect, right? Yeah. And my husband said something, we were just dating at the time, and he said something that for whatever reason I don't like, of course, I don't even remember what it is, but I threw a remote control at him. And he he looked at me like, he was just like, excuse me? And he said, uh, if you're one of these women that acts crazy and is going to throw things at me, I am not going to date you. I'm going to go home now. And uh, if you want to stop acting insane, I guess you can call me. Otherwise, don't bother. And he left. And I sat there and my first reaction was like, ah, well, and then it took about two whole minutes of thinking about what had just happened for me to be like, I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm that girl, right? I'm the girl right. that throws stuff. Oh, you know, like, I don't want to be that. He's right. You know, like, yeah. what would my defense, what would my rational defense be for why I'm allowed to throw stuff at you? Like, so I, that was like the beginning of me going, oh, shit. Yeah. yeah maybe, I need to work on myself. Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe my attitude could use some work. And then like throughout the course of, I'd say the first five years of us being together was most of me like deprogramming all of that kind of stuff out of my head mm -hmm. and um, learning how to have a real relationship. Now he brought so much to the table for me that I would have been foolish and stupid to not, um, to not learn and adapt and become a better girlfriend and then wife, right? I would have been stupid, but most women think that doing that is like akin to slavery. I am now enslaved. I am now brainwashed. I am now like um, at his mercy and um, I'm, what's the word? I'm vulnerable, right? right. And we don't want to do that because we fear monger women to death that men are these like predatory, violent, awful people who are just waiting for their chance. They're waiting for their chance to abuse you, to do you wrong, to exploit you. And you always have to have your guard up and you can't, you can't let yourself be vulnerable. You can't think of serving him because that will make it dangerous. 
and I thought about that, right? I asked, I kind of asked myself, like, why am I resisting this? Like, what mm -hmm. is it that's making me resist? If, if I really think he's this great guy, which I did, mm -hmm. what's making me resist? And so I kind of walked myself mentally through that of like, okay, do you think he's going to abuse you? Because I was in an abusive relationship prior to him. And there was nothing about him that made me think that he was going to be like that. And I was like, okay, and he's never done this with any other woman. Uh, I know his family now. His family says, what? Andrew would never No, He's just not remotely like that at all. He mm -hmm. would just leave. Like if things were really bad or really heated, he he's the kind of person that would just leave the situation because he'd be like, this is getting crazy. So I just kind of had to walk myself through it and be like, why am I resisting? And I realized it was just all of this fear that had been kind of implanted into my head about the risk of men and that men are like this dangerous creature that you have to be really careful around yet also they tell you to like date them and marry them and have babies right. with them and I was like, this also makes no sense <laughs> so it was just kind of a process of me rationally thinking through these things and going oh i think i actually think most of society has got this wrong but that's tough to do that's tough right. to do because you feel it feels a little scary like but could everybody really be wrong? And in this case, unfortunately, I think that they are. And that's why I'm so glad that you have a book and it's not just <laughs> me. Like there's more. <laughs> well, I think that things like this are going to turn the tide because yeah. things aren't working at all right now. All these dating shows that are so popular, all of these like Manosphere red pill shows would not exist and be as popular if things were working. Right. Things are not working. So. Yeah. It's funny because I always notice this phenomenon in our culture right now where it's women um, who complain about their husbands. Usually what's happening there is that they married a guy or dated a guy who basically just kissed their feet and the whole time that they were dating. Oh, they always look at the relationship and how the guy treats them. And they're enamored at first with the guy giving them what they want, telling them they're great no matter what, telling them they don't need yeah. to change. But what happens in a marriage is that women lose respect for those guys immediately because they're not men. And so yep. those are the women that go around complaining, oh, my husband never does this and never does that. The, the, the mark of a good relationship is that a man knows he's high value and he says, listen, I will not be treated a certain way. And a woman who's a good woman who is also high value says, you know what? You're right. I need to change myself. I need to look at things that I'm doing wrong and change yourself. And I tell women this all the time. I'm not perfect. I had, a, I had a similar background to you. I had a lot of unlearning to do. But you know what? I married a guy that I respected the hell of out of. And I wanted to please him because he's a high value guy. And I'm like, you know what? I need to work on myself. I need to have the humility mm -hmm. to say to myself, I do lots of things wrong. I need to be open to hearing what those things are. And yeah. I need to fix it because I ultimately want to please this guy. I really love this person. And I really respect this guy because he knows his value and he expects to be treated a certain way. And that's what women find attractive in men. It is. So this is, this is totally how we screw ourselves. Yeah. Stephanie is so right. I knew she would get this. Um, yeah. Women think they want these uh, simps who are going to be, oh, you're so beautiful, baby. I love you so much. And do the like over the top romantic gestures every day yeah. and give them tons of attention, and all of this adulation and praise. And what happens after a while is the woman starts to realize, okay, this guy is basically just a simp. Like he's so desperate to keep me. That must mean he doesn't really have options. Right. And that must mean that no one else is really knocking down his door. Yeah. And it, whether they, they don't consciously think this through, it's just like something in their ovaries knows that that makes them unattractive. It makes them unappealing. It makes them unattractive. And that is for, it's partially why you see women go after these bad boy types, yeah. but that's that's like a distortion right that's like a distortion the the proper um the proper way to do that is you get a guy like we have who are they're just firm with their boundaries they're not mean they're not abusive or anything like that they're just like no i'm just not going to put up with a whole bunch of horseshit from you i'm just not <laughs> like, sorry um and there is something very attractive about a man who's got boundaries and is like no just no you know, yeah. they are willing to tell us no. And yeah. but we program women to rebel against that. So it's like this weird paradox where 
they want the man who will tell them no, but they also hate the man for telling him no. And they feel like they have to prove that they, like, you're not going to tell me nothing. You can't tell me anything like this attitude, right? So, but well, yeah, right, that's how. Can I, can I make a comparison? It's not Yeah, absolutely. Most, it won't be the most popular, but um, maybe maybe with your, your people it will be. But Here we go. It, <laughs> it is like with children, right? Where you see a, a, spoiled, a spoiled kid in the mall and he's miserable and unhappy. I'm thinking of a season four Simpsons episode that captures this really well. The kid, like his mom gives him everything and he yeah. wants a new video game. And he's like, get two because I'm not sharing with Caitlin, mom. And she buys him whatever he wants. And and Bart goes, that must be the happiest kid in the world. Because he doesn't know. <laughs> Whereas Bart has actually loving, loving mother, uh, Marge Simpson, who tells him, no, you're happy when you have boundaries. You're happy when you're told no. You're miserable when you have no boundaries. And, and with women, I, I don't claim to be... Uh, psychologist or a female psychologist but one thing i've learned being married and even doing the uh the matchmaking that we we've done which i'd, I'd like to mention it oh yeah time. we're gonna talk about that for sure it's oh, it's fun. a great scientific peek into the law of averages what all <laughs> women want and it's a peek into ephesians 5 20 not the ephesians 5 22 23 24 but like 26 women respect your husbands, men love your wives, is that women, win kings don't simp, they want a king. They like getting the stuff. They like not being told no. Like you can shop for shoes endlessly, honey. You can gain weight. You can, you can gain weight. Bag. You can have all the bonbons, but then they're not sexually attracted to their husband. Like the man that's like, no, stop, stop. You've bought five pairs of shoes. Stop. You've had you know, probably no bonbons is, is too many. Probably half a bonbon is too many. But um, stop, please stop. I'm I'm not trying to be a dick, but you have to stop. Uh, right. They like that, and they're. I mean, they might not like not having the bonbons or the shoes, but they like the man because and you it's, know what they're it's attracted sexually to? attractive. They're attracted to masculinity and strength. Yeah. And you don't. No woman believes a man's going to like really throw down and protect her or really have his situation under control who allows himself to be bossed around by somebody half his size and half his intelligence and half everything else right, I, I, right. A woman, you're not going to find a man sexually attractive and this is why we have an epidemic of women complaining about their husbands in, in public because they marry the yep. cop they marry the guy that's mm -hmm. like oh at first he did he told me everything i wanted to hear and ultimately women don't respect that they don't respect that when you're living with that day in and day out you find guys like that are told what to do by their bosses, told what they do by other men. You, women want a guy that's like, listen, I'll be told what to do by our Lord and Savior because that's my ultimate boss. But right. everything else, I'm the man and I have good judgment and I make the rules and I make the the, the decisions in the family. The sexual yeah. fantasia about a man that will be like, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Go make dinner. Get off the bomb ones. Get off the couch. Do whatever. I don't, don't make it. They're like, oh. Getting, getting swooning over, over just a man that'll say, you know, not not rudely, just like, honey, I love you. You have to do these three things in your day. You can do the rest, whatever you want with the rest of your time. Do these three things. They're going to they're gonna be really sexually attracted to you, man, if you do that. You just talk to them like a loving boss, which is what you are, and yeah. they'll be attracted to you again, uh, you know, yeah. with control. the dad bod. Yeah. Take control. Well, I totally agree with that. It's certainly true for me. Um, everybody in my husband's chat makes fun of me because I'm always like, oh, he looks so handsome tonight. Or something. And they're always like, okay, calm down, lady. We get it. You like him, you know. But honestly, it's like people don't believe this is real. They're like, you're never going to be with someone 16 years and be just as into them as you were at the beginning. And I'm like, I am, if not more, maybe, because as he's gotten older, he's gained wisdom and experience and competence. And he's like, uh, one of the things I find so attractive about my husband is he is so self-controlled. He, mm -hmm. he has a saying, he says, never let your passion rule your reason. Mm -hmm. So he may have a lot of passion or emotions or things like that, but he's very like measured. He doesn't just lose his temper. He doesn't He's dangerous in that he could like kill most people probably easily with his bare hands. And he's a firearms expert too. So he's a very, he could be dangerous, but only for good. And he's very controlled and he has total like mastery of himself. 
I never have to worry that he's going to like freak out or have a meltdown or anything like that. And I dated guys when I was young who did that. And it was very off putting. It was, it would give you anxiety. Like it, it wasn't attractive at all. And one of the things that's one of the things I like is he's just so in command of himself and his own um, like emotions. And right. that's, and we as women, a lot of times we're not because I'm sure, you know, if you've had seven babies, we have a lot of hormonal ups and downs in life as women. And those are real. Those are super real. Cause I'm like a very uh, level headed person. I have a pretty even temper, but you know, postpartum and pregnancy and like everything in between, there's just a lot of hormonal ups and downs that are really hard to navigate and having a really like calm centered person in your life like that is such a blessing. Like I can go to him if I'm like, I feel like I'm emotional and I don't know if I'm making sense. Yeah. He'll be like, you know, he will be like my rock and help me sort out like, okay, what's going on? Are you being rational? Are you like, are you tired? Like sometimes he'll be like, honey, I think you just need a nap. And I'll be like, okay, I'll go take a nap. And yeah. then I'm fine. Yep. Uh, it's and funny people that think that that's like me putting myself down. They're like, I can't believe you yeah. put yourself down like that. And I'm like, it's just, it's true. Right. Yeah. I think the feminists, they need to believe that women like you or I are unhappy in our marriages or being yes. treated badly. And the truth of the matter is quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, Tim and I, we, we counsel lots of different couples and we oftentimes to, to younger people, we open our home and we have friends that come stay with us just to show like, like, this is the real deal. Like I adore this man. And I always just joke, like if, if he goes, I better go right. I'll be buried alive in that coffin. <laughs> so I want to be with him all the time. I know. You I feel work, like that too. You work on your marriage and you treat each other. And this is not mutual submission. This is that's baloney. No. That's bull crap. No. It's the yeah. wife giving to the husband what he deserves and the man giving the wife what she deserves. And those are entirely, sometimes they overlap like love and respect, but for the most part, they do not overlap. They're different yeah. things. And if both people are giving each other what they deserve to have, which is in scripture and the magisterium and the church fathers, all of that, it's very clearly laid out, yeah. then you can have, it's a hundred percent real thing. And all of the couples that he's, he, he'll never brag about this, but when he was a high school teacher, he, he counseled lots of young people. And four of those young people are now married, very young, all have babies, all have beautiful marriages. And it's, I know it's a large part to do with the influence that he's had on our lives because he just tells them the, just the straight 100% facts. And sometimes they're yeah. hard to hear, but if you take that hard advice and implement it in your life, you can improve your marriage. Yeah, but the the life that I have now, I did not believe it was real when I was growing up because I was always told it wasn't real. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. My parents are divorced. Um, they've both been, you know, like my dad's been divorced multiple times after. Um, and they fell, you know, they totally fell for all the boomer programming. <clears throat> so that's how they lived and that's how they did things. And I really just didn't think it could be like this. And I almost felt like I stumbled on this amazing secret or something, right? Yeah. Like I was like, what? Like, this is amazing. It's so great. And I'm so happy. It's, it's a different level of happy. It's like this fulfillment uh, that you can't totally quantify and put into words how great it is. We are, and Andrew will tell people, he'll be like, my wife is like, losing her would be like losing the right half of my body. Like right. that's how close we are um he's just like i can't imagine you know not having her like what things would be like and i'm i'm the same way and people i don't think people experience that because everyone's so promiscuous you know the average woman has like a dozen bodies or more under her belt by the time she gets married and i think the pair bonding and the ability to really like join as one has kind of evaporated and it it really damages that it's really um, destructive to people's ability to even do that. But of course, the other problem we have is atheism and, and non-belief being on the rise or in Christianity itself, this perversion of Christianity into something totally different. The, the right. boyfriend Jesus, the hippie Jesus, the mega church nonsense where uh, it becomes what I always have called self-help Christianity. Right. 
-hmm. where you you go to church to get your happy feelings you go to church to hear how wonderful you are and that jesus loves you and that you don't need to change anything and you feel really good for an hour or two and then you go about your life as normal the rest of the week that's most americans now i would say and um, i tell people too i was like jesus does the quote unquote meanest thing anyone can do and that is that he sends people to hell so he's very <laughs> very specific on the things that he wants the people that he wants to accept. And remember, our Lord was so angry at the temple. He fashioned a whip in real time and just beat people with it. So this is not the hooray for everything, happy, clappy Jesus. This no. man has standards. And luckily for us women, those standards are very clear. And you can gripe about it all you want to, but it's very clear, especially in Catholicism, what those standards are. There's yeah. uh, a term for what you were describing, Rachel, and what step you're always complaining about this coined in the 2009 i was in i just begun law school it's called moral therapeutic deism and it's exactly what you're saying christianity got overrun really in all three major strains of christianity protestantism roman catholicism eastern orthodoxy by moral therapeutic deism it means there's no hardcore rules it's like a giant yeah. self-help book yes. with some um manners at, at, at etiquettal norms that are suggestions mm -hmm or ideals. And um, because the self-help genre has given into uh, female worship, the number one rule, the cardinal rule of feminism is you never say a negative thing about a female. You never yeah. show a, a, a male being a good guy while a female's the bad guy. You'll never see that in a movie after 2000. A man being better at a woman at things. Yeah, Not better. Right. Particularly, I mean, he might be better at folding the laundry if you watch a Tide commercial now. Which, right. Which just proto yeah. gender dysphoria. Um, but it's all it's all psych stuff. It's all cognitive behavioral therapy. It's all moral uh, therapeutic deism, where it's just, hey, th these are these are suggestions. At, at yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, t I love something I heard you say in your podcast. You do your masculinity podcast on Fridays, right? With Elliot Hulse. And who are the other two fellas that you have? Uh, Will Noland and yes. Dr. Michael Robillard. Yes. And I heard you guys talking about this has even snuck into Roman Catholicism and in Orthodoxy. In fact, I am planning the takedown of a certain organization within orthodoxy that seeks to institute female deaconesses and of course eventually priests and all that sort of thing and they want they explicitly want feminism in the church um so the, they're working hard on us too don't think it's not sneaking into our church too it is um but there's this thing that like a lot of the priests are doing now where they're talking about this servant leadership can you explain servant leadership and why it's wrong <laughs> thank you i could play for you what i didn't play on pearl's show when rachel you and i were on yesterday uh they haven't they haven't uh, aired it yet uh, but it's um father mike schmitz who is the the pre resident priest and the main presenter for ascension presents they have other chastity speakers like jackie francois that that get oodles of views and women's prophets they're, they're women's pro what dostoevsky calls women's prophets um mm -hmm. they just and they're considered right of center they sound kind of hardcore if you bring up abortion which is honestly it's a really it's a really easy issue for a christian because there's no um purple bluish lobby uh against abortion because that that kind doesn't really care about abortion because it's not an option for them right but um yes on on that ticket, Father Mike Schmitz will say, like, look, su sub wifely submission is wrong. Um, you shouldn't expect your wife to submit to you. And yes, I, I don't, ha I, I should just get you the quote. He says, I don't have a hard time with men being leader, but here's what I mean by leader. Uh, buckle up, buckaroo. He says something It's funny. It's annoying. like they say like, with men who, who are um, being leader, it's... Uh, the, I think the argument is, is that you have to reach a certain standard to be leader or you have to carry all the burden and you get none of the benefit. Yeah, of all the burden, none of the benefit. Of a leader. And that is not how it works. Yeah, you have all, all the responsibility and no right. authority. And I heard yes. that this, I heard this guy kind of make the claim that Christ was not the head of the church and that he, yeah. he was just the servant who came to sacrifice himself. And I'm like, no. What? Christ was very that is clear. not. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what the rules are. Christ came in and said, these are the rules. And so much so that, like I said, at the end of your life, he'll say, did you follow the rules? Yes. Good. If not, you're going to hell. I mean, I don't know how it gets more black and white, definitive, brutal, and just leadership than sending people to literal hell for not following your rules. Like, if I, I use the term <laughs> like, you know, imbecile or, or evil, I think, you know, the current... Um, inhabitant of Rome is, you know, somewhere between those. I, I don't know if you can be both at once, but then all of a sudden they know what I mean. They're, they're going to Webster's dictionary and they're saying imbecile means this evil means this. They're not running all of the complex uh, hermeneutics of continuity on right. evil or imbecile. But when you True. bring up submission or the term leader, which I've been using the term leader since, you know, every other G.I. Joe was about power struggle. Who's, <laughs> who's the leader? Destro or Cobra Commander? I know what a leader is. And so when Father Mike Schmitz is telling, I'll just play it for you, if you don't mind. Sure. When he's yeah, saying, absolutely. hey, you know, you are the leader. But here, now he, read the boilerplate, two-minute definition where I'm basically defining into this natural kind, the definite, the quiddity of being a leader, uh, of being a follower. And I'm saying the follower is really the leader. It's like, okay, I, I see what you did there. It's it's not very shrewd, but it works on oh so many people. Before you, before you play that, just before you listen to these clips, just think in your mind, like this is this man is saying this because he doesn't want to make women angry. Right. I don't want to yes. make women mad. Right. I don't want to make, make women mad. So here, yeah. listen to this baloney. Okay. It, it's a baloney sandwich. <laughs> And the half of it. So again, there's there's Catholics, there's Christians who are like, yeah, we're being adamant about this. Scripture says, wives, submit to your husbands. He's going to lead. Okay, he's going to lead. So I'm, I'm going to embrace that and be true to the Bible. Okay, great. Question. Where's the Christian vision of leading? Like, what is the Christian vision of the one who's called to be the leader? Well, where do we look? We look to none other than Jesus himself. So Jesus is the head, we're his body. Jesus is the bridegroom, we're the bride. How does Jesus lead? Well, he doesn't say, I'm here to make the decisions. I'm here, I'm the one who's in charge. He says, the son of man, meaning himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So yes, husbands, lead. What's leadership look like? It looks like that. So they're saying he's saying basically that you could only lead as long as you serve, which I think most good husbands out there, that is what they're doing. This man would lay sure. down his life. Jesus laid his life down for us. Guess what? I know for a hundred percent fact, if, if, if it came down to it, there is no doubt in my mind, Tim would do the exact same thing for me. Yeah. But that is not, he does not owe uh, my submission just because of that, because right. of, yeah. But it also means that the final decision, like Jesus did, he actually said Jesus was not the leader of the church, or he said Jesus wouldn't say I'm the leader of the church. I'll give you an example from two nights ago. We literally had the baby that swallowed a hair and was, was <laughs> coughing up. And Steph is the most loving mom in the world. She literally was like, okay, can, can we check? I'm worried there's something else down there. I was like, look, we can go to urgent care. Turns out, this new town we moved to, all the urgent cares are just glorified doctor's offices that close at seven. So we got out and I said, look, look, we're, I'm, I'm not taking my kid to ER. Um, ER um, has you, two doors down. Don't take your kids to ER, people. Two doors down are child protective services. They will take your kid or come into your home. So do not go yeah. to the ER. It's the way that all the first world kids end up getting trafficked and put into five. We're not going there unless it's a you know a, an emergency heart attack. I was right. going into like mom reptilian brain where I was like something's wrong. I know it is without really much evidence. Right, <laughs> you've been there. You I've been me. there. Yeah, because you're love. You're like I was like so. I mean, I said it maybe a little brusquely, but I was like, sorry, we're not putting the kid in ER. We're gonna wait this out. We have to. We'll stay up and watch her breathe, but we're, we're not going to ER. And, Steph, being a good woman, she was really, she's like, well, it's going to be an uncomfortable night. And I was like, well, if it is, it is. I'm, I'm just letting you know this is what it is. And this is what we're going to do. And she really wanted the opposite, but no histrionics, no tantrum. You did get sleep that night, right? Because yeah, you realized fine. it was the, the, silly. The, for people but... who are watching, the baby was fine. She had like a feather in her throat. And I got Perfect. out. And yeah. she was just coughing a little extra. And Tim was like trying to reason with me. He's like, she's fine. And I was like, there's something wrong. And he was a hundred percent right. <laughs> she was sleeping and like eating. And I was just like, oh, okay. 
Maybe yeah. when we were first married, it would have been <laughs> it would have been more history. But it was just literally like Steph's like, oh, oh okay, I'm trying to regroup and, <laughs> and recess. And you do. And so you work. Uh, yes. Am I the servant leader? Uh, yeah, I really try to be. I sincerely, I try to be. Am I, I have my own stuff to work on. You know, I, I really do that. I know his, you know, you put, put, put an enemy in front of me, I'll go through him to protect her. But I, particularly after what happened with Abby, I, I really struggled badly with um, hypochondria. And just so everyone knows, it's not all about just the woman perfecting herself. I didn't realize how this kindly, sweet woman, my best friend before we were even dating, was, I could tell, legitimately thrown off by the hypochondria we had right after Abby was um, was born. It was because it took me out of that, that self-possession mode that Steph was so used to me being in. Yeah. You know, there's an out of control dude. If there's a guy that needs putting down or taking down, or there's some bum walking to near, you know, an outdoor seating area or whatever else you want me to go change something on the top of the car or wet roof or walk through the sleet or snow, that's fine. Yeah. But I got weird with that. And I didn't understand what it was until I 10 years into marriage started realizing, oh, the self-possession is literally what women are sexually attracted to. So <laughs> yeah. I have things that it's not just the women, it's the men too. Oh, but I will say servant. Yes. Yeah, so I'm a servant leader, but the, the, the few times me and this chick right here ever disagree, <laughs> which I will be fully honest. It's, it's rare, yeah. you know, once a month at most, even on little yeah. things. I, yeah, I'm I'm taking the decision down just like just like Jesus. I am in charge of this little church in miniature. And can I just say too, there has been like no I can't even think of an example where he was wrong. Like when I when I um have had like, well, no, I really think this, I really think this. I, I really can't. His judgment is 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 solid because I married a good guy. Like I, I can't think of a time where I was like, oh, I was totally right about that. <laughs> he is usually his judgment is usually spot on and I know it's, yeah. there's been so many times throughout the years where I've really felt like I was right mm -hmm. but I'm like mm, okay we're gonna do what Andrew says right and he always turns out to be right mm -hmm. he always turns out to be right um and I heard you guys talking in a different uh video about how uh like how uh Tim you say Stephanie can give wise counsel and that's cool and that's great and you listen to it and things like that but ultimately it, your decision is going to be the decision and it's the same exact way in our household it's not that andrew doesn't care what i think or or ask what i think sometimes but it's like just because i say this is what i think or this is what i want does not mean that that's what we're gonna get it's just not it doesn't mean that that's what we're gonna get and it at first that's a little uncomfortable but i think with a little bit of time it's like good wives aren't born. We're not mm -hmm. just like created out of thin air. We have to kind of learn and become good wives. And um, I was wondering like, how, how has that been for you guys? Like, did you get right into these roles right away or did it take some time to fully embrace them and, and feel like natural and comfortable in them? Not at all for me. And and that's where I do sympathize a lot with the feminists. I wasn't ever a, really a feminist, but I had a lot of really bad ideas. And, and, and I'm a convert to the faith. And I think the turning point for me was just being humble enough to say, you know what? God created me. He created me for a purpose. And I need to look to him to know what the rules are and what he expects of me in my life. And it, the church is though, that though she hasn't really taught much about feminism or the role of the woman, because everything's always against uh, a men these days. Once you start looking into that, you have to be as a woman humble enough and love Jesus Christ enough to overcome your own selfish tendencies or your self defensiveness and say, you know what? I'm not the Virgin mother. I have, hundreds and hundreds of flaws. And let me start just checking off and becoming a better woman. Um, Cause beauty fades ladies, it, it, it fades. And yeah. at the end of your life, you got to keep your husband's attention. You have to keep your soul good for the Lord. And the way of doing that is a constant reassessment of the things that you need to work on. And the unfortunate thing about women that I'm seeing right now is they are utterly incapable of doing that. They're incapable of doing that for easy things like how they treat their husbands, 
how they present themselves to their husbands. N nevertheless, things like, oh my goodness, you know, I really have a nagging problem or an ungrateful problem, or I really have an X, Y, or Z problem. You just, I have a, still a lot to learn, but one of the things I think the Lord for that he created me with is at least the desire to want to please him and the desire to want to please my husband. Yeah. And yeah. You have to have humility to do that. <laughs> you know what I have said before about that? Because um, people will be like, well, why is this the hill you want to die on? Like, why is this your thing? Mm -hmm. um, well, the reason it's my thing, number one, is I feel like feminism actually ruins chances for women like you and I who want families. I've always my whole life just wanted like a secure, peaceful, functional, happy family. I wanted kids. I wanted a husband. I want that life. And feminism makes it so it stacks the cards against us to the point that in order to have that, you have to be total rebels like you and I are. And you have to get all this heat from other people and you have to swim against the current. And it's very hard to do. Yeah. Um, but even more than that, it's like, how do I even say it? It's like this feeling I had of just, I want to be a good woman. I want to serve people. I want to care for my children. I want to be nurturing. I like making people happy. And I feel like my whole childhood growing up, everyone and everything around me from my parents to the culture, to movies, everything was trying to beat that out of me, Right. that I should not get this joy from serving other people. That exactly. by, you know, by caring for my children when they're sick or rubbing their back before they go to sleep or staying home and spending time with them because that's more important to me than some stupid job or, you know, bringing my husband his favorite meal after he's worked all day and he's just like, oh, wow, this, thank you so much. This is so great. The joy I get from that, I was shamed for getting that joy. It was like, no, you need to be a boss lady. You need to be telling people what's what you need to be Absolutely. in charge. You got to have your own money. It was like, I even remember my dad, my very well-meaning dad, who I love to pieces saying to me when I was like a young adult, I just don't know how a, a person like you is going to get along in the world. It's just, it's such a tough world. And you're just such a, like a motherly, you know, uh, giving, like loving person. You, he's like, you were like that from the time you were born. You've always just been that, that way. And I just don't know how you're going to make it out there. It was like, everybody fear mongered me that if I was this like loving, caring, submissive person who wanted to serve people around me, that's what really gave me joy and what I wanted to do, that that was wrong and it was bad. And I had to like train myself out of it. Well, your, your happiness, everyone out there who's listening is Rachel just intoned. Is inversely proportional. <laughs> it's inversely proportional to the amount you listen to boomers. So it's directly <laughs> proportional to the amount that you're like, okay, a boomer said it. So do the opposite. They ruined everything. So mm -hmm. it was actually, the, 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 you know, it was in the water to be ruined before then. But like, how can a woman have a happy life for having a a, a sweet, docile, uh, girlish attitude, womanish, womanish attitude? Uh, that you know, it's Aristotle's function argument easily. That's also, how you have it. Can I ask you, when did it become like a thing? When <coughs> started talking about their stupid, boring jobs. My eyes, I don't care if you're like a NASA astronaut, like my eyes start glazing <laughs> over the back of my head. It's so dumb. Like these women who talk about their jobs, it's like that is. You're, I don't care, ladies, I don't care what your job is. It's stupid and boring. And if if you dropped out right now, anyone would replace you. Your company Nobody would, would care, you. right. Nobody would care. They'd replace you like that. Where you can't be they replaced would. at home. You're utterly, utterly irreplaceable there. And I always tell my kids this. I like At the end of my life, what am I going to care about when I have all of my kids surrounding me on my deathbed, hopefully, and um, in my old age, hopefully, and all my grandkids. And I'm looking into the eyes of all the people that I served at the end of my life about to meet my creator. Am I going to be... Legit, are these women legitimately going to be like, man, if only I had made that other deal or set, spent more time in the office. Your job is stupid. No one cares about your job. Uh, it, it, it's, it's meaningless. They would replace you like that. The only place yeah. that woman is unique and irreplaceable is in her house. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, my husband's friends will try to bring their like normal wives over 
<clears throat> and they'll be like, so I says to him, I says, I've gotten the same email 20 times. Why do, why can't we just streamline this process? And they'll be like going on and on and on about their office job or something. And I have to sit there and be like, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. It's hell. Uh -huh. it's hell. Oh, There's nothing yeah. worse than if a man talks about his job, that's rough. That's but hell. if a woman's talking about her job, I'm on the verge of suicide. Which is Ameri <laughs> American <laughs> leftism strains. I talk about this in my first book, Catholic Republic. We Americans, we're, we're queer as a $3 bill, right? Whether you're Orthodox or Catholic, because the, the country has this weird, I call it prod and light foundation where it's like yes. the religious right has its roots in the Protestant Reformation, which is yep. just early enlightenment. The secular left has its uh, roots, its grandparentage in the French enlightenment, which is just yep. later enlightenment. So it's prod and light. And so the one thing that all strains of far left leftism that originated in America agree about are prod and light points like work, labor. You mm, So you get yes. the weird mashup of the Protestant work ethic Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, where you guys worship their jobs and talk about their boring, like manure salesman job or whatever <laughs> at Friday night dinner parties is like, dude, no one gives a fuck. I don't like, care. We don't care. Like we, yeah. we, we sincerely <laughs> don't care what you do. Like just yeah, have it's a good this weird. And entertain us. Yes. I even talk about this in my book and it's one of the reasons that some people will get mad and don't like it. Cause I say, look, you have to understand that the wackiest, craziest Protestants are the ones that came and settled here. Okay. Right. We got some of the weirdest <laughs> yeah. Protestant sects yeah. like Puritans and Quakers and Shakers and um, yeah. like, all sorts of bizarre Protestant cults that came here. And that's what our foundation comes from. So you get this weird blend of do what thou wilt, the like libertarian streak, which like, okay, not everything in libertarianism is just outright bad. I mean, neither, none of us are libertarians. I had my like libertarian streak in my youth, mm -hmm. but you get the, the libertarian streak combined with the Protestant worth, work ethic stuff. And then also like this weird, thing where it's like, well, on the one hand, we want to be Puritan with our morals, but on the other hand, we love rebelling against those same morals. And like, uh, you know, you get your rum spring, a thing where it's like, well, you, you know, like my parents were like, you're going to do some drugs and you're going to, yeah. you know, yeah. drink and you're going to have some sex and that's fine. You know, you do that when you're young and then you grow out of it. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Right. What it's, kind of parenting? Like, that's definitely not what yeah. I did. I did not do that with mine. I was not like, you know, just have your wild days in your 20s and just, you know, um, do all the things. No, I didn't do that at all. But it is this weird, specifically American ethos that we come out of. And somebody in the chat was a little upset that we're dissing on the boomers. But let me just say, I've said this before, if you guys haven't heard it, the boomers were subjected to the worst programming in all of history because they were in this weird period where tv was brand new um you had mk ultra going on mm -hmm. and you had um the post-world war ii programming was the cold war stuff was super insane and you did not yet have alternative media like you didn't really have like conservative radio even or the internet of course so like the i know the boomers got the worst of the programming so i'm not really trying to be mean to them but i mean the results of that programming have been pretty disastrous so and also do, boomers boomers are the only ones the sorry, sorry boomers but you're the only ones that are that sensitive about your generation if any yeah, of you boomers true. say like list them please i'd love to hear it like the 25 <laughs> worst things about my generation i'd be like yep 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 yep, yep. and yep <laughs> be fair, yeah, and don't, don't pretend like you don't make fun of millennials and yeah. zoomers okay yeah, boomers. boomers make fun of my generation and i will be clapping beside you being like you're exactly right yeah. you are darn me right too. about that yeah, Boomer, me stop being so sensitive about your generation you know it's ridiculous yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's but they do they will get a little salty they'll get a little bit yeah. mad at me because everyone picks on them all the time but here's why because like sorry they deserve it it, it was the generation <laughs> where the wheels fell off and yeah and you also yeah. forgot their civil rights era so they think they sincerely think like being racist is uh, like the mortalist of all sins. Yes. Like, yes. Is it worse than like, what if this guy is like a little bit racist, but he's an otherwise yeah. like really nice guy. And they're like, oh, they, that can't be. And I was Just like, about, oh, totally what if disavow. someone's like a murderer 
and but they're they turn out to be a really nice guy like well that's in the bible that's there yeah they're, they're like, like jesus they're, forgives murderers <laughs> it's so murderers. true yeah, but what it's if a so guy true. likes like all of the races of the world but he picks out one and he's not a huge fan like could he be a, a like a pretty nice guy other than that like no of course not what do you and it's because civil, he's a, civil rights he's an nazi yeah yeah exactly don't I, be so sensitive boomers come yeah, on yeah come on guys come you on. you guys Rachel said it right. You have the, the program, the post-World War II, literally this whole country changed between 1946 and 1949. Our entire yeah. foreign policy changed forever. Yeah. The country inverted. Then you had civil rights era stuff come in. Then you had the MK Ultra stuff. It was and then the sexual the revolution CIA. and yeah. all the feminism. So we get it. Like, don't be, don't be mad, boomers. If you're watching my channel, I appreciate you, and I They're love good you. boomers. We call them base boomers, the ones yeah. that get it. Oh we, yeah, they, I love the base that. boomers. The yeah, base so boomers are great. The They're, yeah. They're the ones that um, the base boomers are the ones that are extra red pilled because they get it. We're not. And again, this is you know categorization work to be predicated to be a real thing you have to be predicated of a, of a category we all have yeah. we all have a yeah. generation that pertains to us it's a fallen society of. all generations are the worst yeah, yeah. and <laughs> you, you're not it doesn't mean every single one it means you know 90 90 percent are better but um so uh, we, we, got, we got maybe like 20 ish minutes left. I'm not going to keep you guys all night. We all got kids and stuff to do, but I want to hear a little bit about the dating service. Tell us a little bit about what's oh, going man. on. I, well, I don't know if I'm even it. saying it correctly, what it is. Matchmaking? Matchmaking. Matchmaking. Yeah. So let me just say, uh, preempt this by saying we got so much heat from the feminists, which is always really funny. They they helped to promote our product. So thank you very much, feminists. You really helped us out. Um, but um, they got so mad about this because we have very high standards. What we noticed in the society, mainly Tim and his buddies, and I'm, I'm in the background helping is that we have a crisis of young, really high value Catholic men and women who cannot meet each other because they have to filter through these like sinful, disgusting dating apps or like the old ladies at the church are putting them together with people, but that's not really quite a good fit. Luckily for us and for Will Nolan, we have pretty sizable platforms for Catholics. So we thought, okay, Nobody else is doing things about this. The priests that were saying things about us, they're not doing anything about this problem. So why don't we do something about it? What we've done is that we are uh, taking applications for young men and young women with very high standards. We don't want any feminist women. We want women who want to stay at home. They want to be under the patriarchy. We don't want men who have a pornography addiction. We want them to make good money to keep a woman at home where she belongs. All low body counts. All low body men. counts. And what we're doing, we're going through the applications. Once we accept, the men are a fee, the women are free. Um, we interview every single person and then we start matching people together. And it's turned into, we thought it was gonna be 30, 15 men and 15 women. You guys. <laughs> it's such a need. We're like, this is becoming a career. I already had this career for the last three years. It's become a career. It's a career. We spend uh, several hours a day interviewing people. And let me tell you something. I don't know what's going on with the younger generations, but they're getting something because we have met such amazing people. People have they don't even watch Tim or Will. Some of these young Catholic women that are in there saying this stuff that we're saying, and it's just because their parents have taught them well. Um, I have been so encouraged. They're Beautiful. exceptional boomer parents actually taught them well. Yeah, them. yeah. Some yeah. of them had like Zelly Martin type boomer parents that just did a really great job. But th so these girls are beautiful. We got flooded with women. We actually need more men. Um, That's we have crazy. Enough. Yeah, I'm not wow. kidding. I am. I have a binder full of just people we've interviewed the past several weeks and it's insane. So we've actually opened it up uh, again. We're taking, I think, applications for men and women or just men. I think just men. Oh. They, everyone was like, this oh. is going to be a sausage fest. You're not going to have it. Really. <laughs> That's what I would have thought. Yeah, you, you'd think. But with, with late 20s, beautiful, like virgin girls, mm -hmm. early 20s. A lot of girls in their 30s with low body counts that are, are really pretty, mm -hmm. sincerely pretty still. We have been shocked. And we we have men. And we have a good – the men that are in there, the good crop. But we need more because we ended up accepting like 70 female applications mm -hmm. for the first round. It's like five times more than we planned because we didn't want to send these girls packing. They no. have nowhere else to go yeah, aside yeah. from Ascension Presents and Father Mike Schmitz telling them – essentially lies a false gospel and they're not going to be able to find a man a good man that way 
Yeah, yeah. so we're excited. It's at um, retvrn.us, return.us. And I, what started off as a let's help these people, they can't meet each other and nobody's really helping them, has blossomed into a full time thing for Tim. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's not the kind of job I ever wanted to have full time. It's not fully full time, but we can't have fathomed the kind of, uh, the marketplace demand for this. I knew it was bad out there. I, yeah. I'm shocked to hear you, Rachel, say the average body count for a, a woman by the time she gets married is 11 or 12. That's that's horrifying. Yeah. But yeah. it's vile. I mean, it's just a, a petri that dish of a culture. That statement needs like a shot of penicillin. Yeah, like that's seriously. crazy. Seriously, but but the that is not the case with the young men or the young women we're getting uh, at uh, retvrn dot uh, dot us and. Uh, it's, it's so funny. It's weird. Never thought I'd be doing this. Rachel, you, you would have laughed that. because I'm a lot of the feminine you are. Oh, we are too. Yeah. Well, it you would really have thinking about you um, because a lot of the feminists, they were really mad. And one feminist said, oh, keep, I'll pay you $500 to keep you guys away from my daughters. And I was like, here's my Venmo. We didn't want I saw her. I was fighting with her on Twitter and she blocked yeah. me. Yeah, oh, did she, she blocked she you. She ended up blocking me because I just yeah. kept pressing her on like basic questions that she couldn't answer as a Catholic. And so finally she blocked me. What was um, her name? No. I forgot you got Melanie. into it with her. Yeah, Melanie. That's something. so funny. Yeah, yeah, I was like, yeah, pay us the $500. We didn't want your daughters to begin with. So. Yeah, it was something like, and she's got like a huge following and yeah. is another one of these like middle of the road, supposedly conservative women that yeah. when you press them on anything important, like Tim said, they're anti-abortion, but other than that, they're basically like neocon normie types that yeah. just are like, well, but I don't, you can't just make women do stuff though. Like, <laughs> and why should we tell them to do, and why can't it, it's just like endless placation of women, just endless. There's never an end to it because once they start, it just like, it keeps going. And it's like, so sometimes I'll just be yeah. like, okay, well, where where exactly are the limits here? Where exactly do we put the onus on women? When do we hold them accountable? What are their responsibilities? You're telling me about their rights. I hear about their rights all day long, but I don't ever hear about their responsibilities because no. <laughs> it's, it's all the contradictory stuff that everybody says, right? Where it's like, if the man cheats in the marriage, everyone agrees he's a scumbag. He's terrible. He's horrible. If the woman cheats, most people's first reaction is like, oh, that's terrible. What did he do to make her cheat? You know, it's, like right. this, it's always like if the woman did something bad, the man must have done something to make her do. Because otherwise women are just perfect and innocent and, and do everything right. And so it's like this it's just this mind virus that we're constantly fighting. And sometimes they'll almost start to get to me. They'll almost, I'll start to go, maybe I should be more charitable. Maybe I should be a little nicer. And the next thing I see, the very next interaction I have, I'm like, eh, maybe not. I yeah. no. the world. The world needs mean girls more than ever right now, because the mean girls are the ones that are just telling other women, like, listen, just trust me for a second. If you just get your act together, you'll be so much happier. Yes. And the mean girls are actually the ones are, is, are the nice. feminist best friends. Yes. Like if you just, I'm telling you, if you listen to Rachel and you just take, she has a great <laughs> marriage. She, she, does, she knows how to keep a man happy. You talk, you listen to women who knows how to keep a man happy. I'm very lucky. I have, my husband doesn't have a pornography problem. He's really into me. He treats me really well. He wants to spend all his time with me. It's like, listen, I, I'm not, a braggadocious person, but I keep a man satisfied. So those are the women that you want to ask. I want to know what Rachel thinks about how to keep her man satisfied because she's doing a really good yeah. job at that. It's true. Yeah. It's and you bad. know what? It's like, there's this idea, there's this idea that if we don't have our own careers, we won't have mm -hmm. accomplishments and therefore we won't have good self-esteem and we won't, you know, be happy with ourselves. It's like, man, especially now that my kids have started to get older, like my youngest is now 11, my oldest is 22. And you get to this point where it's like you start to really see the fruits of all of those years of sacrifice and like hard work. And you're like, ah, I kind of did a good job. I didn't do too bad. These kids are turning out pretty great. Like yeah, they're, yeah. they're out in the world doing good things and they're like good human beings. And yeah, I do have this great marriage. And like, you, it is actually 
far more fulfilling than anything I've ever experienced from a job. And the book, listen, the book has done really well. And I've been super blessed to be on some really huge shows. I don't know how the heck that happened. It's kind of <laughs> like, it has to be God's providence. Cause I'm like, I, I have no idea why I'm on Tucker Carlson. Cause people will be like, she has to be CIA. There's no reason she should be here. And I'm like, you're right. There's not, I don't know how this happened, but here I am. Right. And, but I get far more satisfaction and like feel good about my accomplishments concerning my family and my marriage way more than anything I've done with the book or online or back in the day when I did used to work when I was young. And I had some good career moments when I was young. I was a makeup artist and a hairstylist and I had some pretty like moments doing that that other women would think were great, but they were just not all that meaningful or fulfilling to me. And it's like, uh, I've created a legacy that will have a ripple effect so far into the future. You know, um, even my oldest, like now that she's in her twenties, she has, you know, told me things that I think every mom wants to hear. Like, I didn't always understand why you and dad were this way when I was a teenager. I thought I had the strict weird parents, but now I'm like, Oh my gosh, thank God I had the weird strict parents or like, she called me one day because she was doing a brunch with some friends who were, um, you know, getting drunk and acting crazy in public, these girls that she was hanging out with. And she's like, Mom, thank you so much for raising me not to act like this because it's embarrassing. And I'm just so glad that, that I don't act like this. Right. You know, things like that. Um, or like, wow, I'm so glad that my parents are together and that, you know, uh, you always, you know, when I was young, I'd get mad because they couldn't ever get daylight between me and Andrew. They would try to do the thing that kids do where they try to pit the parents against each other. And they would know even maybe mom is more sympathetic. Maybe if, if dad wasn't here, I could get mom to go for this. Right. Right. But I would always just be like, Nope, sorry. Dad says no. And if dad says no, then it's no. And they would be like, "Mm," you know, when they're teenagers. Mm -hmm. Um, But now they both kind of said to me, like, we're actually really glad that like you always back dad up and that you guys were like solid on stuff. So like they, they go through their teenage years where maybe you'll get a little pushback or you'll get a little bit of like, why do I have to have the weird Christian parents that won't let me smoke pot, you know, or whatever. (laughs) But when they get older and they have to go out into the world, my experience at least has been that they're like, wow, I'm actually pretty grateful that I had like these weird parents. Um, So I've, I've just gotten so much out of what I've put into my family that it's insane. It's like, it's not even a contest there. I have no regrets about like, oh, I wish I had gone back and had a career or any of that nonsense. It hasn't been the case for me at all. It's cool that I'm getting to do this now, but only because I'm getting daily messages from young women saying things like, man, all I want is to be a mom. I want to be a stay at home mom. I want to have a big family. I just feel like my parents won't understand. I feel like I'm expected to go to college. I feel like I have to have this career, but you know, your show or your book or something I heard you say, uh, gave me the courage to choose this path for myself, even though I know like my parents are worried or people don't agree. Like I, if I start to get like, you know, uh, sad about it or discouraged, or I feel like I'm going to give in, I'll just like listen to one of your shows. And I feel like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this. Right. Right. So it's, it's that it's like having that effect on people. If I just think about the effect of what you guys are doing with the matchmaking service, if we only keep a thousand families total, married and not divorced right and having children and they're raised at home with their own mother imagine the ripple effect of just a thousand families if we can convince them to stay married have mom be at home maybe even homeschool ideally right Mm -hmm. that will have a huge effect on the future of this country what the the truth is too is that when you have a husband like you and i have the feminists like to imagine the scenario where the children will grow up and resent them or hate them. And it's actually yeah. the opposite. Tim, yeah. my daughters worship the ground this man walks on because not yeah. only does he treat their mother with devotion, love, and respect, but he is amazing with the kids. And as a matter of fact, my daughter yeah. said something so sweet. She said, mom, I'm just so worried that I'm never going to meet a guy as good as daddy. And I'm telling oh. you, he is their favorite parent and they love him 
because he is a man. Yeah. <laughs> and the feminists can cry all they want to. They have their daddy <laughs> issues. But you know what? A str- and women out there who had good dads know that. They know like, you have a strong yeah. dad and that is worth just everything. I mean, it I is. It, it, it has moment. such a huge effect on girls growing up. And it's funny because yeah. one of one of our daughters, she has daddy gave her a nickname. And sometimes I'll call her by the nickname and she'll be like, mom, that's dad. <laughs> that's dad's nickname for me. <laughs> it's weird when you say it. And I'm like, oh, sorry. I guess I'll just, Oops. you know, yeah. it's, it's true though. Like they, they really do that. My girls are the same way. It's like, daddy is, daddy is the best daddy ever. And they just love him to pieces. And yeah, it's like, everybody thinks he's this mean, mean, grumpy old man or something like he must be this mean bad guy and i'm like i get treated like gold i don't know what y'all are talking about like you can make up all the fantasies you want to about the abuse i must be suffering there's this like thing all the time when we do debates where the dumb feminist i'm debating or he's debating will be like rachel blink twice if you need help (laughs) yeah it's that one it's like it's it's like oh you're the one that's married to the cuck okay you need to you're probably blinking in like recession all the time but it's like I, I i get that i get that all the time actually one one woman i know who probably is watching this right now mrs um homemaker who was on my ask your husband conference said something and and tim does this for me it's like i actually have to be careful about the things i ask for because i know if i mention it she said this about her husband if i say oh i like this dress or hey look at yeah. this he'll buy it for me he'll buy it for I me know. like that and that's not because i'm a spoiled I, i'm a brat or anything like that or he's trying to kiss my butt or anything like that it's because men who are high quality males like we all have they know mm-hmm. how to treat a woman well and not be yeah. a cuck <laughs> yeah yeah well my husband my favorite thing that he does is he buys me guns oh, <laughs> he'll, like surprise me with a new gun and it's always something that's like really fancy that he wouldn't buy for himself he's like a bit he's like i want to be able to throw it in the mud and pick it up 20 years later and it still shoots <laughs> That's the kind of stuff. But for me, he'll get something like really shiny and fancy with all the bells and whistles and the it's pearl like, handle. Yeah. I just my one rule is no pink. No pink guns because yeah. nobody is scared of a pink gun and I don't want the intruder to think it's a toy. But like he's gotten me some really cool fancy toys to play with. So I love that. Um that's kind of like his you know, some women get flowers, I get guns. I'm fine with it. I love it. It's great. You gotta for know me. your woman. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, it's been so great having you guys on. I feel like this episode is going to be very popular and people are going to love it because it's a lot of like practical advice. What are our lives really like? And I don't, you know, we don't always talk about that, especially like Tim and I are both very like, let's do some theology and philosophy and talk about history. And like he can, Tim can really do that all day. And so can I. Uh, But I think sometimes it's nice for people to see that we're real human beings with real families and that this is what our lives are like. It's not some kind of weird grift where we act like, oh, we are a very happily married couple with a traditional marriage, but like we're really doing well and enjoying life. And, and it's really, it's a wonderful existence, I must say. So I'm, I'm so happy to hear from other couples that have the same thing. And we can kind of just break this nonsense, this fake uh, illusion that people have that this is not possible, that it doesn't really exist, Uh, especially for men. Men don't believe my husband when he tells them the advice that Tim tells him. He'll be like, no, you, you have to, you know, you can't just give in to everything she wants. And, you know, he'll try to give men this advice and it's like they don't believe it. So I feel like uh talking to you guys and putting this out there too will help men see like how so many guys were raised by single moms and they really feel like they have to just give in to the demands and they have to give in to what women want and and they have to cuck or else oh well then i won't get any female attention it's like nah that's it's the opposite of that and yeah. for women it's not terrifying you can be a traditional wife and you're not gonna get beat up and you're not gonna not get then. abused yeah so yeah. <laughs> No oh cheating my. and beating. Yeah, they, they'll always associate it with cheating. Cheating and beating. Yep. It's the cheating and beating. Which, by the way, I'm going to do a whole show on the statistics about that and how they yeah. totally hijacked that narrative and made that up because that needs to be done too. Yeah, just um, like pick. You, you have the option of picking a good husband. If you're tough, smart, and independent, just pick a good one. Come on. 
Let's get with it. <laughs> yeah, you can do anything, ladies. Remember? Let's yeah, pick exactly. a time. Come on, let's it's do not it. Not that hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for let's bringing us on, Rachel. We had a good time. I did. I did like talking about praxeology some today with with you two ladies. So and that's not yeah. always yeah. what I do, but yeah, maybe it helps people put the guns away a little bit. I I, I doubt it that yeah. they they're yeah. going to be howling for all of our blood anyway. But you know, game. <laughs> okay, on. we can take it. We yeah, can we can take it. it. We can yeah, we don't care. Whatever. I mean, that's why Tim's shows rules for retrogrades. His his logo tells you everything you need to know. And, you know, my husband and I are doing the same exact thing. We're out there fighting the same kind of culture war stuff and trying to just prove all this nonsense that everyone believes to be wrong. So tell everybody where they can find your books, your shows, your work, what you might have coming up, anything like that. Well, thanks for always having our back on Twitter. You're you're yeah. you're a good friend on Twitter, and and we want to bring you <laughs> on. We want to bring you on rules for retrogrades. Uh, I, I think we're going to do another women's conference or step. I'm not going to step. Well, <laughs> um, she did the first one. That's actually how we met. Uh, you're going to do a child rearing one. Yeah, I haven't fall. decided the topic, but I definitely want you a part of this. It's sure. you've, got, you've got to be a part of it. So I'm really hoping that you can. Um, but yeah, it's uh, Tim's on YouTube. It's Timothy Gordon on YouTube. He's on Twitter, Timothy. That's T I M O T H E E O L O G Y. Um, we have a website, timothyjgordon.com. That's uh, Gordon with an O N. And we have a lot of free classes on there, actually, for Catholics. Oh, really cool. great stuff on there. Um, just Baltimore Catechism, just tons and tons of stuff for homeschoolers. And then our matchmaking service is return.us, and that's R E T V R N. So. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a million, awesome. I do have one dono chat from Sabrina Fair. She sent $25. Thank you so ah. much, Sabrina. That's really generous. I totally appreciate you. She's always here and she's such, she's so supportive of me and the show. She said, another great show. Thank you for having the Gordons on. I found Tim on Jay's show. What a blessing. Keep up the great work. So oh, that's nice. yeah. a lot of what Sabrina. we're trying to do here is just be encouraging people need encouragement because we're in the minority and the world tells us we're weird and we're doing it wrong. So yeah. don't listen to them. They are silly. Don't listen. That's to right. Them. Well, yeah. thanks again for coming on you guys. I'll love to do anything with you anytime. Anytime you want me on, just give me a holler. I am here. If you know, the feminists are coming at you on Twitter, just tag me. <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. Uh, guys, by the way, again, their matchmaking service. By the way, somebody asked, is that Catholic exclusive? Yes. Yeah, right now it is. It is. We we take uh we take Protestant girls who are willing to uh switch over okay. to the faith. But yeah. a, a, maybe at some point we can help some Orthodox girl. Like I said, oh, we're really yeah. we're really Catholic Orthodox ecumenists. It's it's a much easier project than uh Catholic, Catholic, Protestant, but at the mm -hmm. moment we're only taking Catholic guys, mostly Catholic girls, some Protestants who because the Catholic men are the men that we 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 have are like the heads of the household, so they're they're not gonna gotcha. want. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we, yep. could, exactly. yeah, we could we could maybe partner with with uh, you guys on on bringing in some Orthodox. Yeah, that's cause, true. Cause it's, <laughs> it's all part. There of is so much demand for it on the side. We even tried to do like a Telegram channel about a year and a half ago, but it was such a disaster. And it just, I I didn't have the time or, or know how to organize that. But yeah, if you guys have kind of cracked the code on this and you want to do something like that, it's, it's the demand is sky high. Let me tell you, it's probably yeah. the thing people ask me the most. They'll it's be like, where do I find a woman? Where do I find a guy like this? You know, yeah. so. Exactly. Think about yeah. the commodity that is being, I was talking about grifting, right? Wait, we get called grifters. It's like, all right, well, let's step into it. Let's own it. Do you want to meet Mr. Right or Ms. Right? Uh, we'll, we'll help you out with it. We'll just own the grifting. Yeah. So, and that's why so. we charge for the men. It's like, hey, if you can't afford the service, then you can't afford a wife. Yeah. I mean, it's just that simple. And we're not sorry for charging because we're putting a lot of time and effort into this. So yeah. everybody can just get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and everybody's yeah. willing to pay for every other app and every yeah. other service. <laughs> it's a return, but with a V. So it's R-E-T-V-R-N dot U-S. That's yeah. right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks so much, you guys. Uh, great show. Thank you for coming on. And everybody go follow Tim and Stephanie, buy their books, 
share all their stuff because this needs to get out there. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to turn the tide on this nonsense. So <laughs> help us out and hit like on your way out. Subscribe to the channel if you're not. You guys can buy memberships and you can send super thanks or dono chats even after if you're watching this after we're live. So thanks everybody for coming and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.